Due to YouTube censorship, there are certain words I cannot say, so you will hear me throughout the video abbreviate them. Certain clips I use for context don't have the best audio, but I fixed them as much as I could. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Also, it goes without saying, any race, gender, religion, or socioeconomic status is capable of anything. The following video contains graphic details and content related to viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to part two of my series of the Duggar family. We have taken a look into Josh Duggar's background and we've also looked into Anna's as well. Now we will pick up where we left off at the end of part one. I would definitely recommend you watch the other two videos prior to watching this one if you haven't done so already. I will link those videos in the description box for your convenience. Now let's get right into it. B, the commentator. Girl, what are we talking about today? Today, we will be wrapping up this series about the Duggars, particularly Anna and Josh Duggar. Hey, I'm B and welcome to my channel. If you're new, thanks for stopping by. If you're returning, thanks for coming back. Before we get started, let me make my intentions clear. It is always my goal to bring truth, information, and awareness to the topics I cover on my channel, no matter who it is. Remember, it's not tea, it's information. 2013 for Josh and Anna was amazing. Josh recently became the executive director of the Family Research Council and was finally able to live out his political dream. Ever since he was a young boy, he dreamt that one day he could serve the country in the same capacity that his father, Jim Bob, did. What happens with FRC the rest of the year? Well, you know, I'm, I'm the executive director at FRC Action, and so we are tasked with really going out there and making things happen. I mean, you know, we're here in Washington, so you don't have to be. That's kind of our voice. We're, we're going out here. We have a team of people who are working on Capitol Hill every single day, going over there. When they're in session, they're talking to their staffs. They're working with them. We're providing them with resources and materials, the tools they need to represent us, to represent you as a people out there. You know, you, you, if you want a government that's responsive, that listens to you, we've got to have people standing beside them that are holding up their arms. And as, as a Christian, as a person of faith, I, you know, I think of Ephesians 6. We, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Now, sometimes there is flesh and blood that we're warring against, but I'll tell you, a lot of times those principalities and powers are so strong and so dark. And I'll tell you, there's not a place that's more prevalent than right here in this city. And so Washington, D.C. needs more people to shine a light, more people that are willing to stand up. And that's what we're doing. And that's what this conference is about, is taking a stand and making your voice heard. So we have, we have a number of resources that we work on throughout the year. I encourage people to go to our website, frcaction.org. That's frcaction.org. We have a ton of resources and materials there you can use Sign up for our email updates. It's the best way to stay informed. We'll put your zip code there, first name, last name. You'll make sure you get your email and you're ready to go. You can stay informed with what's going on. With Josh finally living out his dream career, Anna stayed home and cared for their growing family. She was so proud of Josh and was quite the doting wife. Your children are a blessing and I am so thankful for the opportunity to be a wife and a mom and to have children and to have a husband that you know, supports and that is helpful in that. And it's so fun to be a team together. And, you know, when Josh comes home from work, it's the happiest time of the day. And so oh, it's just stuff. like encouraging children to mm -hmm. love their daddies and to love God. And so it's really how the different things work, how um, the family structure yeah. that got ordained, it works and there's so much joy and fun being a mom but yet it is really exhausting yes. but it's the best thing ever the couple would celebrate their six-year anniversary and everything seemed to be moving forward in a positive direction and in fact today is my wife and i's six-year anniversary and we have three kids and i always tell people one of each anyway they're all individual in their personality you have to watch how you say that nowadays unfortunately her world was about to be flipped upside down Anna would be subjected to the first scandal of many in 2015. They had been living in Oxon Hill, Maryland for about two years and had recently discovered they were expecting their fourth child when news broke about Josh's past. The public was shocked to hear that Josh had emmed four of his sisters and a babysitter as a teenager. I would like to add something for context. During this period and moving forward, it's quite difficult to talk about Anna without talking about Josh. For Anna, outside of her husband and her children, she didn't really have much of a life. Josh's actions have greatly affected her. So we are going to talk about the situation involving his sisters as well as the babysitter, although it was already brought up in my Josh Duggar video. This time, we will compare the 2006 police report 
to the 2015 Megyn Kelly interview and add more information to the situation. I don't like to recycle content, but 2015 was an eventful year for the Duggars. And in order to wrap up this series, I have to discuss the events as they took place. I know this is your son, and I know that, that you're trying, and this was many years ago. But don't downplay this, especially after what you guys have done in the name of Christianity and God to other people. I'm just saying, that's just my feeling. <laughs> more respect to the victims as well. They needed to bring up more topics about what the girls that suffered these atrocious acts went through and how their they daughters. helped it. Their, their daughters. daughters. And girls not their yeah. daughters as well. I mean... But I do I, think um, they... They had, they did come forward. I no, do they didn't. They, they, no, they didn't. Leaked. They, it, it was and leaked. They, and they're mad about it. It was leaked, but I think... And they're mad. And it, first of all, it should have never been leaked. Those, those. But that's different from saying that they didn't come forward. It was leaked, and yeah. they didn't come forward. But they did try to to help Josh because he killed daughters. Right, I understand. <laughs> but I'm just saying. Do you know how hard it is to exactly. turn your own child in? They did go to the they police. They did send him to a private Christian. But they based did go treatment to the police and outside they did. of law enforcement. But the bottom line I mean, is, listen. is they did not come forward. This is they were forced forward because somehow this got leaked, and nobody knows who did it. The police report pertaining to these incidents were leaked to the public, and the reaction to this was one of confusion. How can this Christian family, this family of unwavering faith, have this happen in their home? How could the Duggars' eldest child harm his younger sisters and a babysitter? How was this possible, and what was Anna thinking? Their report, obtained by In Touch Weekly, stated the following. James, also known as Jim Bob, quote, said that in March 2002, Josh, who had turned 14, came to him very upset and crying. Jim Bob said that Josh told him he had been sneaking into his sister's bedroom at night and touched his victims on their as they slept. Josh told his father this occurred on four or five occasions where he snuck into their room and ended them. Josh admitted to touching another victim as she slept on the couch. This police report was taken December 2006, four years after it took place. Listen to what Jim Bob and Josh's victims had to say about these incidents in their Megyn Kelly interview, which took place June 3rd, 2015. And he was crying and he had just turned 14 and he said that he had actually improperly touched some of our daughters. He went and confessed it to my parents and Neither they shared you. it with us. No. None, of, none of the victims were aware of what happened until Joshua confessed. And then it wasn't like we were keeping a secret afraid or something. It was we didn't know until Josh explained to my parents what his thought process was, what everything was. How did you learn about it? I mean, did, you, did your parents sit you my down at a meeting? Sat or my what parents happened? took us aside individually mm -hmm. and they said, here's what what's happened. happened. And at that point, of course, you're like, Oh, you're shocked, you know? So your parents like, were the ones to tell you yeah, my you, you were molested or oh, yeah. Did you notice the discrepancies? In the police report, Jim Bob claimed Josh came to him upset and confessed to emming his sisters as they slept. He admitted that this happened on four or five occasions. Yet in the Megyn Kelly interview, Jim Bob would insinuate that it only happened once. The victims, Jessa and Jill, would also say it only happened once. Let's keep going. The report also stated that one night after Josh snuck into his sister's room, one of them woke up in the midst of Josh taking off her blanket that was covering her as she slept. Jim Bob claims the victim in this situation didn't remember anything else. He also admitted that a female minor told him Josh touched her on multiple occasions. Yet, in his Megyn Kelly interview, Jim Bob claimed none of Josh's victims knew what was going on. Did he explain why? I mean, was that a question that you asked? He said he was just curious about girls, and he had gone in and just basically touched them over their clothes while they were asleep, and they didn't even know he had done it. So then how could a female minor tell Jim Bob what Josh did if she was unaware of it? Well, two months later, in July 2002, Josh would admit to Jim Bob that on another occasion, he molested another victim as she slept on the couch. Jim Bob told the Arkansas Police Department in the police report in 2006 that after this incident, they disciplined Josh. But nine months later, in March of 2003, Josh would M yet another victim. So here's another discrepancy. Jim Bob, Michelle, and Josh's victims, when asked by Megan Kelly how long they were in the house with him after these incidents took place, they would all insinuate that it wasn't long and almost immediately Josh was removed from the residence. Right after that? He, he did pretty soon after. I knew at the time I was, 
I was young, so it kind of seems like everything was a whirlwind or whatever. Was there time but that you were I in know. the house with Josh knowing this prior to him going away? Not, not, not really. I think, I think that whenever it was brought to my attention, it wasn't, it wasn't very long after that Josh would weigh. But in the police report, the allegations were made in March 2002, and the had been going on prior to that date. Then it happened again two months later in July, and then seven months after that. Well, that's a long time. Josh wasn't removed immediately like they claimed. The police report would also state that one day, as the children were reading the Bible during family Bible study, a five-year-old victim was sitting on Josh's lap. Josh would touch her chest. Now, I read the police report and certain things are blacked out. From what I read, someone ran and told Jim Bob what had happened. I don't know if it was Josh or if another person saw what he did and notified the parents. According to the Megyn Kelly interview, Josh supposedly emmed his five-year-old sister and then confessed this to his parents. He just was weeping and, and shared immediately what he'd done. And so we were weeping and the little one was like, what's wrong? I can't confirm that as in the police report, it is blacked out who confronted the parents. In this report, Jim Bob also admitted that another victim was standing in the laundry room when Josh put his hands under her dress. After these incidents happened, nine months since the first one began, Jim Bob would meet with the elders in his church for guidance. According to the report, they would all agree that Josh needed to be sent to a treatment facility for help. One of the elders Jim Bob sought help from was a chaplain at the Piney Ridge program at Vista Hospital. Jim Bob and Michelle were concerned with Josh being sent to this treatment facility because he would have been exposed to other offenders and things they didn't want him exposed to. Instead, Jim Bob and Michelle would find a Christian program in Little Rock, Arkansas they were more comfortable with. On March 17, 2003, oh wait, let me make this note really quick. Who knows how long the gap was from when Josh emmed his five-year-old sister and his other victim in the laundry room? We don't know how much time passed between those incidents and March 17th. In the Megyn Kelly interview, Jim Bob and Michelle claimed they removed him and sent him away that same day. But we now know in the report that on the day these incidents happened, Jim Bob went to visit the elders in the church. I would imagine it would take some time for them to find the Christian camp Josh was ultimately sent to. However, on March 17, 2003, Josh was sent to this training facility camp led by Harold Walker. Josh, along with several other young men, participated in a construction project and received one-on-one -on -one faith counseling from an unlicensed counselor. Josh would stay at this camp until July 17, 2003. After three months, he returned home and back with his family. Upon his return home, Josh apologized to his victims, according to Jim Bob and Michelle, and the victims forgave him. After Josh made it right with his victims, Jim Bob took him to speak with state trooper slash sheriff Joseph Hutchins has something that he needs to share with you. And we actually took a witness with us. We went in and sat down, and he shared everything. He told it all. He told everything. Hutchins was a friend of Jim Bob's. He allegedly spoke to Josh and gave him a good old stern talking to. Once the conversation was over, Hutchins went on his way and never reported the incident. Later on, it would come out that Hutchins, who was now serving a 56-year prison sentence of his own for CP, claimed that when Jim Bob approached him, requesting he speak to Josh, the abuse was downplayed and Hutchins was unaware of the extent of what happened. Hutchins claims that Jim Bob only told him about one incident in which he stated Josh inappropriately touched one girl through her clothing while she slept. Hutchins claims Jim Bob swore it only happened once. Because the Duggars claimed it only happened once, and that after the incident they sent Josh away for counseling for three months, he didn't report it because he didn't understand the severity of what actually occurred. Had he known the truth, he claimed he would have reopened it. This is what he told U.S. Today in 2015 when news broke. Hutchins said, quote, I did what I thought was right, and it obviously wasn't. If I had to do it again, I would have told him immediately that I am going to call the hotline and contact the trooper that worked those cases and have a full report made. I thought I could handle it myself. I have lost a lot of sleep over it. I am a Christian myself and I worry that something else may have happened. I would be responsible for it in my opinion by not reporting it. The young girl should have been my first priority, end quote. After this report was made public, Josh released the following statement, quote, 12 years ago, as a young teenager, I acted inexcusably for which I am extremely sorry and deeply regret. I hurt others, including my family and close friends. I confessed this to my parents who took several steps to help me address the situation. 
We spoke with the authorities where I confessed my wrongdoing, and my parents arranged for me and those affected by my actions to receive counseling. I understood that if I continued down this wrong road that I would end up ruining my life. I sought forgiveness from those I had wronged and asked Christ to forgive me and come into my life. I would do anything to go back to those teen years and take different actions. In my life today, I am so very thankful for God's grace, mercy, and redemption. End quote. After Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar, along with Josh, made their statements, the world was wondering what was Anna thinking. She had four children with this man. This man who is now known for emming five victims. Did she know about this prior? Was she going to divorce him? We had so many questions. Anna would follow up with a statement of her own. She would say, quote, I can imagine the shock many of you are going through reading this. I remember feeling that same shock. It was not at the point of engagement or after we were married. It was two years before Josh asked me to marry him. When my family and I first visited the Duggar home, Josh shared his past teenage mistakes. I was surprised at his openness and humility and at the same time didn't know why he was sharing it. For Josh, he wanted not just me, but my parents to know who he really was, even every difficult past mistake. At that point and over the next two years, Josh shared how the counseling he received changed his life as he continued to do what he was taught. And when you, our sweet fans, first met me when Josh asked me to marry him, I was able to say yes, knowing who Josh really is. Someone who had gone down a wrong path and had humbled himself before God and those whom he had offended. Someone who had received the help needed to change the direction of his life and do what is right. I want to say thank you to those who took time over a decade ago to help Josh in a time of crisis. Your investment changed his life from going down the wrong path to doing what is right. If it weren't for your help, I would not be here as his wife, celebrating six and a half years of marriage to a man who knows how to be a gentleman and treat a girl right. Thank you to all of you who tirelessly work with children in crisis. You are changing lives, and I am forever grateful for all of you. End quote. Anna was doing what she was taught to do as Josh's wife. She was taught to stand by him, no matter what. Convicting me that pride is reserving for myself the right to make the final decisions. And um, I remember us because marriage is a picture of God's love. Yeah. And so I remember just... God convicted me of that and just really trying to keep that as my focus of this is God's day and he's the one bringing us together and how can we glorify him yes. together. And Anna's family devoted their lives to full-time ministry, serving those in prison and helping them turn their lives around. How could they do that but yet turn their backs on Josh? They wouldn't because that would mean they were hypocrites and it went against everything they believed in. The world was shocked. How could this secret be amongst a family who seems perfect? And how could Anna, along with her parents, agree to marry a man who admitted to emming several girls? If you go back and look at Anna's past, she was raised in a family where her parents mentored troubled youth and believed in redemption. Now, how could they dedicate their life to helping those that made mistakes and then turn their back on Josh? Josh would resign from his dream job that same day after their statements were published. The couple along with their three small children, would flee their home and go back to Arkansas with the Duggars. This scandal rocked their family. The public was angry, disturbed, confused. Yet Josh would receive a lot of public support from politicians and other authoritative figures, such as former governor of Arkansas Mike Huckabee and his family, preacher Ray Comfort, and several others. Even the disgraced former IBLP leader Bill Gothard would comment on the situation, stating the following, quote, the fact is, he did touch his younger sisters. He was a teenager at the time. He touched them in the wrong places, which was totally wrong, but the sisters weren't even aware of it. Josh acknowledges it. He tells his parents, and they tell the sisters, and that was the first time they had learned about it. Same thing with the babysitter. She didn't know about it. He added, quote, This is really quite different to what you think. It has been overblown. It is not like he is a sex. He was a teenage boy. Gothard added, quote, What he did... Touching over the clothing is not nearly what you think it is. It was wrong, but unfortunately, there's a lot of this going on in many families today. End quote. This statement is coming from a man who was accused of several young women and girls in his own organization. When Anna and Josh fled Maryland and moved back to Arkansas, they would go under the protection of Jim Bob. Once again, Josh was receiving a lot of praise and support from his community while his victims relived this whole traumatic experience all over again and were forced to do the Megyn Kelly interview where they would publicly defend their and retract their claims in the 2006 police report. But um, 
I do want to speak up in his defense. Like, people will get mad at me for saying that, but I'm like, I can say this, you know, I was one of the victims, so I can speak out and I can say this and, and set the record straight here. Like in Josh's case, he was a boy, young boy in puberty and a little too curious about girls. And that got him into some trouble and he made some bad choices. Um, but really the extent of it was mild, inappropriate touching um, on fully clothed victims. Shortly after, Anna and Josh would welcome their fourth child, a daughter named Meredith. But a few months later, another scandal would happen, this time catching Anna completely off guard. On August 19, 2015, reports came out that Josh had two accounts on the Ashley Madison website, which was a website designed for married people to cheat. After the site was hacked, it was revealed that Josh had spent $986.76 for two separate subscriptions between February 2013 and May 2015. On the website, Josh submitted the criteria that he was looking for in a person to cheat on Anna with. He was looking for someone that was, quote, professional, well-groomed, stylish, classy, casual jeans, t-shirt type, muscular, fit body, petite figure, tall height, short height, long hair, short hair, girl next door, naughty girl, sense of humor, imagination, creative and adventurous, relaxed and easygoing, aggressive, take charge nature, confident, discretion, secrecy, a good listener, good personal hygiene, an average sex drive, a high sex drive, dislikes routine, has a secret love nest, disease-free, drug-free, and natural breast. Also paid $250 for a guaranteed affair and also had multiple accounts on other dating sites. The revelation of Josh's secret life devastated Anna, who had just recently had a fourth child. So, on August 20th, 2015, Josh would make the following statement. He said, quote, I have been the biggest hypocrite ever. While espousing faith and family values, I have secretly, over the last several years, been viewing pornography on the internet, and this became a secret addiction, and I became unfaithful to my wife. I am so ashamed of the double life that I have been living, and I am grieved for the hurt, pain, and disgrace my sin has caused to my wife and family, and most of all, Jesus and all those who profess faith in him. I brought hurt and reproach to my family, close friends, and the fans of our show with my actions that happened when I was 14 to 15 years old, and now I have rebroken their trust. The last few years, while publicly stating I was fighting against immorality in our country, while hiding my own personal failings, as I am learning the hard way, we have the freedom to choose our actions, but we do not get to choose our consequences. I deeply regret all the hurt I have caused to so many people by being such a bad example. I humbly ask for your forgiveness. Please pray for my precious wife, Anna, and our family during this time. End quote. According to the IBLP, there are seven basic needs of a wife. Number one, a wife needs a husband who demonstrates spiritual leadership. Josh is supposed to lead his wife in her spiritual journey by consistently pursuing a deeper relationship with Christ, by making wise decisions and demonstrating genuine love. Number two, a wife needs to know she is meeting her husband's vital needs. Josh is supposed to encourage his wife to meet his needs and show her that no other woman can meet them except for her. His wife needs to know that she is precious in his eyes. Number three, a wife needs a husband who cherishes her. Josh is supposed to love his wife. He is supposed to tenderly care for her and nurture her with reassurance because if she does not feel cherished, she will become insecure. Number four, a wife needs a husband who will protect her. According to the IBLP, a wife needs a husband who will alert her spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical strengths and weaknesses, and to lovingly provide wise direction and security. Scripture instructs husbands to dwell with their wives, giving honor unto them as unto weaker vessels. A husband can accomplish this by establishing boundaries that she will fulfill her responsibilities within appropriate limitations. Number five, a wife needs to have intimate communication with her husband. Number six, a wife needs a husband who honors her. And number seven, a wife needs a husband who invests in her life. The man Anna believed was God's best for her was a man who brought so much pain, heartache, and trauma. The public for certain thought, oh, surely she will divorce him. It's come out that he emmed several girls and now he's also a cheater who made countless decisions to deceive his wife. But there was more. On August 26, 2015, Adult entertainer Danica Dillon claimed she and Josh had intercourse on two separate occasions where Josh agreed to pay her $1,500 but instead paid $1,000. 
In later claims, Danica alleged Josh became very violent while having intercourse to the point of emotional and physical injuries. He was very rough with me. In all honesty, though it was consensual, it more or less felt like I was being rough. He was tossing me around like a rag doll, forcing me to go into positions. Danica says she had no idea who the 19 kids and counting star was at the time and says she ran into Josh a month later at another club where she was a featured dancer. He walked up to me and he goes, I am so sorry for the things that I did to you. I've been a fan of your movies. I've watched your scenes that this is what you were into. I'm sorry if I ever mistreated you. And I believed him. Danica would later sue Josh for $500,000, but the suit was dropped. On September 2nd, 2015, an anonymous woman came forward and claimed she had a pregnancy scare after having unprotected intercourse with Josh. Then another woman who worked in the adult entertainment industry came forward and alleged that she had a similar violent experience with Josh like Danica. Anna's brother David would make several statements calling Josh a pig and in support of Anna divorcing him. Her brother stated that he would financially support her and her four young children if she left Josh but his offer would be rejected by Anna as she chose to stand by him. It must be noted that a few of Anna's siblings distanced themselves from the IBLP belief system they were raised with and no longer follow these teachings or this ultra-conservative Christian ministry. Susanna, Anna's sister, who she was the closest to growing up, left the community after she moved out of her parents' home at the age of 19. This was a big no-no in their community, as it is very common for girls to live with their parents until they are married. Susanna, Anna's younger sister, had a daughter out of wedlock in 2013 and raised that child without the father's presence. She recently married a man who also doesn't practice this belief system and appears to raise her daughter in what her family would call a secular world. Her daughter goes to public school, which again is completely against their principles. Daniel, Anna's older brother who called Josh a pig, has also left the community, which was why he was in support of Anna leaving Josh. Daniel was married but has since divorced his wife in 2018. Anna's older sister, Rebecca, has left the ministry and no longer subscribes to the belief system Anna's parents and family practice. Rebecca divorced her first husband and is now remarried and wears pants. The rest of Anna's siblings fully support the IBLP movement and continue devoting their life to this belief system. By the end of August, Josh would get dropped off at rehab by his brother, John David. The treatment facility he went to was Reformers Unanimous Center in Rockford, Illinois. It is a Christian treatment facility Jim, Bob, and Michelle have a close connection to, as they are friends with the founders and have spoken there in the past. Michael and Suzette Keller, Anna's parents, were in support of her staying with Josh and working through their issues. They encouraged Anna to turn Josh over to God and allow God to work on his heart. The Duggars, Jim, Bob, and Michelle were also in agreement. According to Anna's belief system, the IBLP offers several steps and guidelines to restoring a marriage. Here's an example taken from their website. Quote, I called her and she listened as I poured out my frustration and anger toward Mark. After I was finished, she said in a very gentle and quiet voice, Well, Dana, what about your own sin? Her question shocked me. My sin? My husband was the horrible sinner who had hurt me so badly, and I was the innocent victim. Now she told me to look at my own sin? In my mind, my sin didn't even begin to compare with what Mark had done. I became angry as she gently told me I needed to take my eyes off Mark and put them on myself. Gradually, God revealed my own sin to me, which was just as bad as my husband's failures. End quote. According to the IBLP, there are no victims. Bill Gothard taught that we are called to suffer for righteousness and that Christ's life teaches us how to suffer. There's a lot of hard work involved in anything that's worthwhile, as you young ladies know in this room. But anything that is worthwhile is going to be hard work. But the benefits and the joy that come are incredible. Like the woman depicted in this example, Anna was encouraged to draw near and closer to God by not focusing on what sins her husband had made, but what she was also guilty of. It's interesting because as I was researching this case, a lot of testimonies that I came across had a similar theme. The women, or shall I say the victim in this situation, blamed themselves in a way for their spouse's behavior and actions. There appeared to be this complex of, well, what did I do wrong? Was I not enough? Did I not counsel my husband properly? Did I overlook his struggles, etc.? A source close to Anna during this time states that Anna had these discussions with her family. Was she not a good wife? 
Was she not pleasing him enough? We are to encourage one another in love and good works. And one way to encourage them as they wake up early to seek the Lord, whether it's um, a short amount of time or a long amount of time, to encourage them that way and help them get out the door, um, just getting their clothes ready, like getting their fast breakfast or to-go breakfast or something like that, but to be able to encourage them for seeking the Lord. Um, one of the verses also, it says that let nothing be done through strife or being Lord, but let each esteem other better than themselves and to encourage our husbands in their walk with the Lord. It's so for not to expect our husbands to be um, this great leader, but to praise them for who they are and who God has made them to be and to be grateful because um, a husband can sense a spirit of like self-righteousness so easily and that can really put a, a, a wet blanket over the fire or even the coals, coals a fire that they have for God. And so just to flame the fan, fan the flames of our husbands and let them know that they are our heroes and they are our spiritual authority and we love them and we look up to them for who they are. Anna was also really encouraged during this time to read her Bible and pour into it. She read scriptures upon scriptures because the Bible is the handbook to life per their belief system. I think the key really is, is as we turn our heart to God, He does have the answers for all of life's questions. As Jim Bob loves to give examples, he's such a good analogy person where, you know, when you get a new car, you get the owner's manual with it. It tells you what kind of fuel, how full to fill the tires with the air. And if you don't read that and you try to make it work without that manual, you're going to mess up your car. How far greater important is our life and our children's lives? But when we look at the owner's manual of God's word, he has the answers for everything in life if we'll just search it out. And I think great preachers like S.M. Davis on SolveFamilyProblems.com, one of my favorites, um, OnePlace.com, go in there to all of those preachers on there, messages that we get to hear, focus on the family and those, listen to those as a, as a family, just whatever you're doing in the laundry room, wherever. That's exactly what Anna did during this time while Josh was away in rehab getting help. So on January 23rd, 2016, after six months, Anna would release the following statement, quote, many have asked how I am doing. So many have asked that it's actually humbling and touching. 2015 was the most difficult year of my life. Yet amazingly, I found that in my own life crisis, God has drawn near to me. He's near to the brokenhearted, Psalms 34, 18. And my faith has been more precious to me than ever before. Just recently, I visited Josh. It was an important step on a long, difficult road. I want to thank all of you for your prayers and your messages of hope. I can never express how your kindness and prayers have brought encouragement when I needed it the most. Outpacing the grief and discouragement at every turn, I trust that God will continue to show his love and tenderness toward us and bring beauty from ashes, somehow, as only he can do. Please continue to pray for me, Josh, and our children. End quote. On March 10, 2016, Josh would complete his treatment at the Rehabilitation Center and return home to Arkansas where he would reunite with his family and begin mending those relationships. Josh would open another pre-owned used car lot and the couple would go on to have another baby. In 2017, Josh's car lot was involved in a scandal. A customer showed up to his place of employment looking to test drive a vehicle. With him was an automatic a salesperson working for Josh's company at the time would purchase this without checking this person's history or if the weapon was clean. Turns out it wasn't. The weapon was used in a prior crime. And the car that the customer test drove, he ended up stealing it. In 2018, Josh's car lot was cited multiple times for not having proper licensing and in compliance with the city. Then, in 2019, the car lot was raided by Homeland Security, which would ultimately shut the car lot down for good. As we now know, this raid was conducted because law enforcement received a tip about CP being received, viewed, and downloaded by someone using the car lot's IP address. There's not much information out there as to whether Anna knew what was going on in terms of the car raid or the magnitude of it, but the couple would go on with life as if everything was great. 
In 2021, they would announce they were expecting their seventh child. But on April 29th, Josh was arrested by the U.S. Marshal for a warrant by the Homeland Security regarding his involvement in CP. It is stated that Anna was devastated. Josh would enter into a not guilty plea and Anna believed he was innocent. At the time, Josh told her someone else had access to his work computer and downloaded this material. She believed him. Remember, she was taught to stand by her husband no matter what. During Josh's bail hearing, it was determined that Josh was in possession of 265 images of CP and files that depicted CSA involving children as young as 18 months. Due to the nature of Josh's arrest, he was forbidden to live in a home with minor children. This would be a huge problem because he and Anna at the time had six, with another one on the way. So a family friend offered to let Josh reside with him and his wife as he awaited trial. The family Josh would reside with were a part of his community and belief system. They, like the Duggars, practiced the teachings of Bill Gothard. The husband, Mr. Reaver, worked in prison ministry with his wife as a homemaker. The Reavers became involved in the situation because Jim Bob, Josh's father, would once again step in to help his son. Jim Bob contacted this family and asked if they would be the custodians of Josh as he awaited trial. The wife, Maria, admitted in court that she was unaware that Josh M'd his five-year-old sister when he was a teenager. She was very concerned about Josh's past and expressed she was uncomfortable being alone with him. Per the teachings of Bill Gothard, the man has complete authority over his family, and since her husband agreed to let Josh reside in their house, she too had to oblige. The judge would even ask Mrs. Reaver directly if she, quote, wants Josh to be in her home, end quote. She responded, quote, my husband has made that decision and I am here to support that decision, end quote. The judge would also tell Josh he was not allowed to be around any minors, including his own children, unsupervised. Anna, being the devoted wife she is, would frequently leave her children in the care of the Duggars while she stayed with Josh at the Reavers' home. The IBLP teaches that a wife is to stand by her husband's side no matter what, and that's exactly what Anna would do throughout his trial. During the trial, investigators played the recorded interview for the jury to hear. Josh would admit his friend installed the Tor browser on his computer, which the investigator would explain to the jury is meant to access the dark web while remaining anonymous. The investigators would continue to question Josh about his devices and notify him they would be seized and analyzed. Josh would state that, quote, I'm not denying guilt. I don't want to say the wrong thing, end quote. The next thing I would like to point out is something I found very interesting. During the trial, Jeff Wofford, the president of technology at Covenant Eyes, the program Josh and Anna used to prevent him from watching porn, was called to the stand. In this segment, it was revealed that Josh and Anna installed this subscription-based program on Josh's device in 2013. Well, that's interesting because his cheating scandal didn't happen until 2015. I wonder if Anna discovered something back then regarding Josh's vices. I wonder if he did something during this time that would warrant them installing this program on his phone. I wonder if 2015 wasn't the first time Anna questioned Josh's faithfulness. As the trial continued, investigators would show evidence of the images that were discovered on Josh's work computer. These images depicted children between the ages of 7 and 12 years old with adult men and women. One particular image showed a 3 to 4 month old being tortured. Anna would show up to court every day walking hand in hand with Josh being the supportive wife she is. But when the CSA images that were downloaded onto Josh's computer were shown, she left the courtroom and was not privy to these images. And after seven days of trial, the jury finally had the verdict. On December 9, 2021, the state of Arkansas would find Josh Duggar guilty. When the verdict came out, Josh put his head down, defeated. He had finally been held accountable for his actions. As he was handcuffed and escorted from the courtroom, he would tell his wife of 13 years, the mother of his seven children, The woman who stood by him through all the pain, embarrassment, and heartache he put her through, that he loved her. He has now left Anna to fend for herself. What is she to do? She doesn't work. How is she going to financially support herself and their seven children? I would assume Josh's parents, Jim, Bob, and Michelle will step in and take care of them. Since Josh has been in jail, Anna has called him daily, sometimes several times a day. This case has left me with several questions. I often think about Josh, and I ask myself, Well, kids aren't born evil. So what happened in his life that created this sick, perverted person? I think about his victims, his sisters, who didn't properly heal from their decades ago. Their community dismissed the severity of what he did to them, and I often wonder how that has affected them now. I think about Josh and Anna's children. I wonder how much of this do they know? Do they know what their father went to jail for? 
And when they do find out and see that their mother stayed with him, how will they feel? I think about Anna and how she has been groomed and conditioned and whether or not she even has the capacity to truly understand the damage Josh has caused. I wonder if her upbringing and her parents' prison ministry caused her to develop a savior complex. When it comes to Anna and her marriage to Josh, I remember my first Duggar video. Anna was interviewed after Josh's cheating scandal and she said, quote, when she married Josh, she made a vow to God that for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do they part, end quote. In her mind and in her heart, Anna made a promise to God that she doesn't want to break because if she broke it, in her mind, she would probably feel that she was being disobedient, ungodly, and rebellious against God. And according to their belief system, the consequences would be going to hell for eternity. Most importantly, I think about the victims in the CSA material Josh viewed. I leave you with this. The COO of Child Rescue Coalition, Glenn Pounder, said, quote, When children are involved, it's not CP. It's, and it is a crime. This is the torture of people. It is the torture of children, end quote. Hey, thanks for watching. I truly value your time. I hope you found this video useful and I look forward to making more content for you in the future. Have a wonderful week and I'll see you soon.